Hey y'all, thanks for checking us out this week. Uh, we've been going through the letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is where our study is going to come from today. I hope everyone's doing well. Hope you're ready for another Bible study. Pull out your Bible and, and study along with us. See what God's Word says for yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 is a verse that I, I think we uh, sometimes we misapply. And let's just see what it says. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. It says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against another. What Paul is talking about, he has, he has talked about himself and Apollos Throughout these first four chapters, back in chapter three, back in chapter three, he talked about uh, he, he talked about himself and Apollos. Uh, at the end of chapter three, he talks about himself and Apollos uh, again, along with Cephas. And in chapter four, he talks again about himself and Apollos. But really, he, all the way back in the beginning, back in chapter one at verse twelve, he says, "Now this I say that each of you says I am of Paul." Or I am of Cephas, or I am of a pardon me, or I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? And now we get up to chapter 4, verse 6, and Paul says, I have figuratively transferred, I have for now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. What he has done is, I, I think, is what it looks like. There were folks there in Corinth who were causing division and disruption. And they were drawing men away to themselves. But it was not Paul and it was not Apollos. There were not folks going around calling themselves Pauline Christians or Apollosian Christians. That's not what was going on, I don't think. And the reason I think that's not the case is because of this verse in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. Paul says, I have figuratively transferred these things to myself and Apollos, for your sake. He's saying, I, I have used, me and Apollos, I have used our names, rather than calling these other men who are doing these things, rather than calling them out by name for their sins, and Paul knew who they were, but he, he says, I have figuratively transferred these things to myself and Apollos for your sakes. Well, it begs the question, why? Why would Paul, why did Paul do that? Why not rather call these guys out by name and get on them with both feet and really come down hard on them? Why did, why did Paul figuratively, why did Paul transfer these things figuratively to himself and Apollos for their sakes? And I think, I think the conclusion that you might come to is that what he's doing is he's giving them a chance to repent. He's giving everybody there in Corinth a chance to repent rather than coming down on them with both feet, which he was certainly, he certainly could have. But it is a, it is a wonderful example. If we, if we study it and if we apply it, it is a wonderful example uh, of how to rebuke people, but, but do it in such a way that it gives them a chance to repent. Sometimes when we rebuke people, we do not rebuke people in humility. Uh, it talks about the meekness of wisdom in, in the book of James. Uh, that all things need to be done humbly, even rebuking sin. In, in one, of the, one of the best places, I think, to see that is in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, as the, you have the account of Jesus and the woman at the well. In John chapter 4, as Jesus says, Whoever drinks of this water, in verse 13, Whoever drinks of this water, will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. You understand what Jesus is doing? Jesus knew who she was. The woman answered and said, I have no husband in verse 17. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Remember what she's going to say later on, Could this be the Christ? See how Jesus treated her? 
Because what Jesus did, and it's a wonderful example, Jesus, for lack of a better way of saying it, he rebuked sin without insulting her. And that is a, a wonderful thing. It's a hard thing to do sometimes. But that's what Jesus did. He, he dealt with the sin. He rebuked the sin, but he could have started calling her every name under the sun. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He rebuked her. He rebuked her, and he rebuked her in such a way that she could see her sin, but he, re he rebuked her, for lack of a better way of putting it, gently, gently, allowing her to see the sin, allowing her to repent is what will hopefully happen. Back in Matthew 18, back in Matthew 18, remember as the Lord had talked about, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and then you have Peter saying, well, how many times do I need to forgive him? Seven times? And what's Jesus say? Up to seven times? Jesus says, no, up to 70 times seven. What Jesus is saying is, remember what James and John, James and John, when they come to that Samaritan village and they are not receiving Jesus like James and John thought they should, and James and John say, do you want us to call down fire like Elijah did and just destroy them all? Jesus says, you don't know what kind of spirit you are of. I did not come to condemn, I came to save. Even in rebuking sin, even in rebuking sin, and that is what Paul is doing in this letter to the, to the Corinthians. But the reason that he figuratively transferred these things to himself and Apollos is because he's giving everyone there a chance to repent. Over at verse, back in 1 Corinthians 4, over at verse 18, it says, Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. Paul knew who they were. He could have called them out by name. He could have come down on them with both feet. He says, Some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. He said, But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod? or in love and a spirit of gentleness. Now, what's going to be the difference in those two things? If Paul comes with a rod, or if he comes in a spirit of love and gentleness, what's going to be the difference between those two things? It's going to be repentance. And thanks be to God that when you come up to 2 Corinthians 7, I believe is the chapter, and what do we read? Godly sorrow had led to repentance in the Corinthian church. They still had, they still had trouble. I'm not saying they didn't have any trouble still, but, but folks did repent. What Paul did, Paul allowed them. And what we need to do, what we need to do is we need to do everything we can that is conducive to repentance. That doesn't mean that we condone sin. That's not what I'm saying. We, we rebuke sin, but we need to be long-suffering. We need to be tender-hearted. We, we need to even be kind in rebuke. We need to be kind while we are letting, hopefully, the Lord, letting the potter shape the clay like he wants to. Okay, so, so we need to be those things. There is a time to have the rod. There is a time that the rod needs to come out. Paul says, I'm going to have to do it if I have to do it. But he, he said, he, he's figuratively transferred these things to himself and Apollos for their sakes. And I think the, the point is he's trying to give everyone there a chance to repent. But then back in verse 6 of chapter 4, he says, he says that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. What they needed to do is they needed to humble themselves. They needed to humble themselves, and I think a lot of folks misapply the middle half of verse 6, but they needed to look at themselves like Paul looked at himself. Later on, he, he's going to say, imitate me. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me in verse 16. But he's encouraging them there in verse 6 that, that they should not be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. They needed to look at themselves like Paul looked at himself. And what that is, is over in verse 5, Paul says that me and Apollos were just ministers. We're just ministers. Down at verse 7, he says, Neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. He says, we're not anything. Later on, down in verse 9, he says, For we are God's fellow workers. There in chapter 3, verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. For we are God's fellow workers. He says, don't, don't be puffed up on behalf of one against another. You guys are servants. You guys, you guys need to be workers. You, you're, we are instruments of righteousness, I believe is what it says in Romans, if I'm remembering correctly. It says we're instruments of righteousness. If you go and you get a, a garden hoe out of the tool shed, and you take that garden hoe, and you take it over to, the, to your little garden that you have, and you use it to start clearing weeds or clearing rocks and cultivating the soil and making the field more conducive to growth, 
Well, who does the credit go to? To the garden hoe? <laughs> of course not. We're instruments of righteousness. Well, who wields us? That would be God. The credit goes to God. Paul says, don't be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Let all things be done for edification. Stop being so proud. Humble yourself. Understand what we've been called to do. We've been called to do the exact same thing that our Lord and Savior did. You know, as the apostles were arguing about who's, who's the greatest in the kingdom, who's the greatest in the kingdom, and there Jesus says, and he gets up from the table, and he goes and he girds himself with a towel, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. What's the lesson? Is the lesson on ritualistic foot washing? No. The lesson, on, the lesson is serve one another. That's the lesson. Love one another. Serve one another. Don't be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Here in, here in chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, verse 7, he says, For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? He's talking about the spiritual gifts, I think. You know, there in Corinth, they had so many of the spiritual gifts, whether it be one person might speak in tongues, one person might interpret, one person might prophesy, one person, you know, whatever the spiritual gift may be. How did they have those things? Did they earn them? Did they deserve them? Paul, I think what Paul's saying is, what makes you different one from another? What makes a, you know, in the context of chapters 12 and 13, what makes a hand different than a foot, different than a leg, different than an eye, different than an ear, different than a nose? Each one God has placed exactly like he wants it. What is that? It's God's grace. They didn't deserve it. It was unmerited favor. He says, what do you have that you did not receive? How did they receive it? By God's grace. Okay, so if they received it by God's grace, if indeed you, re you received it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? If, if you are what you are by the grace of God, where is the room for boasting about that? And Paul talks about himself over in chapter 15 at verse 10. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul knew who he was. He was an apostle. He was a chosen vessel of the Lord. But he also knew that he was the chief of sinners. He knew that the only way that he was saved was by the grace of God through faith, and that not of himself, lest he should, be, lest he should boast. He needed to do the works. He needed to walk in the works that God prepared beforehand. He needed to obey. But he understood how he was saved. By the grace of God, he was, he, he was what he was. And we today, by the grace of God, we are what we are. If you're a good father, why are you a good father? It's because God has shown you how to be a good father. If you're a good mom, what makes you a good mom? God has taught you how to be a good mom. If you're a good son or a good daughter or a good employee or a good boss or a good anything, how is it that you have been able to do those things? By the grace of God, we are what we are. That's what, that's what it boils down to. Well, if we are what we are by the grace of God, where is the room for boasting in that? There simply isn't any. Back in 1 Corinthians 4 now, verse 8, says, You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us, and indeed I could wish you did reign and that we also might reign with you. What that is, is that is sarcasm. And anybody who thinks that sarcasm is not in the Bible, they don't understand the Bible, and they have not read the Bible, because what that is, that is sarcasm. Earlier in chapter 3, he says, I couldn't talk to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as babes in Christ. That's not sarcasm. Paul says, y'all are just babes in Christ. But how did they think of themselves? Oh, they thought they were already rich. They thought that they reigned as kings. They thought that they, they, thought they knew everything. And Paul says, no. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. That's why he's going to instruct them to pursue the greatest gifts love, faith, and hope. They had a lot of trouble. They had a lot of trouble, and they needed, they needed to humble themselves. But I think, back in verse 6, concerning that verse when it says that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, I think the misapplication, and I've made it myself before, the misapplication is to think, well, what that means is that you don't add to the Bible or take away from the Bible. Well, the problem with that is here in 1 Corinthians 4, guess what? There's still a, quite a bit of the Bible that's going to be written. I don't think that's the point, and that doesn't mean that I disagree with that point, uh, that we do not add or take away from Scripture. There are numerous verses concerning that, but I don't think that's what Paul is talking about in this verse when he says, 
I have figuratively transferred these, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. I think what he's saying, I think what he's saying, the primary application is he's saying, you need to look at yourselves like me and Apollos look at ourselves. You need to imitate us as we imitate Christ. Don't think more of yourselves. Don't think more highly of yourselves than you ought to. Because what we are, as he's about to talk about the apostles, the apostles that God has displayed, us the apostles last in verse 9, as men condemned to death. Uh, the point that he's making is you need to look at yourselves as servants of God, nothing more. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to follow Christ. That you humble yourselves and you give the glory to God. We are ministers we are workers. God gives the increase. God gets the glory. I hope you've enjoyed this study. I hope you have found it edifying. God bless you. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. I'd love to hear from you, and I will respond to any question you might have. Hope you have a good week. Until next week, thank you for watching.